Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Richards. I'm a gastroenterologist at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and I was asked to talk to you today about GI symptoms and neuroendocrine tumors. I'm not going to get into all the details, things you guys probably already know. Neuroendocrine cells, though, are present throughout the lungs, the GI tract, the pancreas, and they're the largest group of hormone-producing cells in the body. They're derived from local tissue-specific stem cells, and they have endodermal origins. And Tumors of these cells can produce a variety of symptoms. Many of them depend on where the tumors are located and the types of hormones that they're producing. So here's a really busy chart that shows you several different hormones that are produced. Many of these are from pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but also you'll notice at the bottom serotonin, which comes from carcinoid tumors uh, throughout the GI tract and other locations. You also see norepinephrine, epinephrine produced by pheochromocytoma is also sort of in this group of tumors. But the point is not to get too bogged down in the different hormones, but rather just to know that the types of symptoms and things that we see are related to the hormones that the tumors are producing, as well as where the tumors are located. So again, just a little bit of background, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, neuroendocrine tumors can show up in the stomach. Gastric neuroendocrine tumors come in a three different types, but really only type three can lead to carcinoid syndrome. Small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors are probably the most common malignancy of the small intestine, accounting for 41% of small intestinal tumors. Their incidence has been increasing and 90% of them are found in the very bottom portion of the small bowel, the ileum. Small intestinal tumor secretions are plentiful. Over 40 substances have been identified, but the things that we think of as typical carcinoids secrete serotonin, and this gets excreted out in the urine as a metabolite called 5-HIAA. Atypical carcinoids lack the enzyme dopa decarboxylase, so they don't secrete 5-HT or serotonin. The clinical features that we see, again, involve what they may be secreting, but also where they're located. So some can present as bowel obstructions, others can affect blood flow and cause things like ischemia, which is low blood flow to an area and damage that area from that lack of blood flow. So people have pain or bleeding. Intussusception is a telescoping of the bowel, GI bleeding, of course. Sometimes people get enlargement of the liver and that can cause pain in the right upper part of their abdomen or have abnormalities of their liver enzymes. And then carcinoid syndrome, which we're gonna talk about, as well as sometimes if the tumors are located in the connected tissue from the small intestine, you can get some other symptoms from blockage of that where people can have partial bowel obstructions or just cramping type abdominal pain. I think it's interesting to notice though that the most common symptom reported is a prolonged non-specific abdominal pain, which is kind of hard to pick these things out from other things that cause pains. Quick word on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Again, these can produce a variety of different hormones and excess of all these hormones can cause different clinical symptoms and syndromes. Functional tumors are the ones that secrete these hormones and cause clinical syndromes, but a lot of them are non-functional and they don't have any clinical syndromes associated with them. They may have some stored hormones in them, but they don't secrete them out. And they might secrete uh, substances that don't really cause any problems. So to get into the carcinoid syndrome, you need a sufficient amount of serotonin circulating around to get symptoms. It's pretty rare in certain gastric neuroendocrine tumors, like we talked about already, type three gastrocarcinoids are probably the only ones. If you look at all the patients at the time they're diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor, about 19% or one in five of them will have symptoms of carcinoid syndrome at diagnosis. But this ranges and it varies based on where the neuroendocrine tumors are. So 8% in lung neuroendocrine tumors, all the way up to 32% in small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors. And the carcinoid syndrome is associated with advanced disease. Survival is not as good for patients who present with carcinoid syndrome. But the good news is that somatostatin analogs are associated with major improvements in flushing and diarrhea in about 75% of patients. Somatostatin analogs should be tried regardless of the somatostatin receptor imaging results. What are the features of carcinoid syndrome? Well, there's a, several different key features, flushing, diarrhea, wheezing, or asthma. Not everybody will have every feature, but many people will have several of them. Diarrhea tends to be intermittent, but it can come in explosive episodes, and the diarrhea is usually watery. 
Fatty diarrhea from carcinoid syndrome or what we call steatorrhea is pretty rare. Abdominal cramps show up about half the time in a large liver in about two thirds of patients. And this uh, condition called pellagra can come up. This is because the neuroendocrine tumors use tryptophan to make serotonin. And by taking all the tryptophan to make serotonin, then they decrease the conversion of tryptophan into nicotinic acid, which is a form of niacin. Features of pellagra include rashes in sun exposed areas, a red tongue, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, dementia, delusions, anxiety, different uh, neurologic dysfunctions. So what can we do about this? Thankfully, uh, nowadays we have several somatostatin analogs, and these are the first line in the management of functional and non-functional neuroendocrine tumors. There's two big ones that we use, lanreotide and octreotide LAR, and these are both long-acting forms of a somatostatin. The uh, immediate form of octreotide is used for some breakthrough symptoms. Somatostatin analogs have all the biologic action of somatostatin, and this leads to suppression of gastrointestinal tract and pancreatic functions. This is why they help with the diarrhea, for example. But because of these uh, effects, you can have other uh, consequences like fat maldigestion and alterations in the absorption of fat or fat-soluble vitamins. So even these medications that are used to control some of the symptoms can have some symptoms themselves like fatty diarrhea or steatorrhea, gas production, uh, nonspecific abdominal discomforts, high blood sugar, low thyroid function. So we mo uh, monitor periodically people's sugar metabolism, thyroid function, vitamin D, B12 when they're on these medications. What do we do if people are refractory to these somatostatin analogs? Well, we can use nonspecific stuff like anti-diarrheal drugs, uh, loperamide, and diphenoxylatropine, better known as Imodium and Lamotil. Um, these are probably better avoided if you're not sure if there's a bowel obstruction or if you have fever, bloody diarrhea, there's concern for infection or undiagnosed inflammatory bowel disease. These agents really just slow down the GI tract. The other things that's been used for people who are refractory to somatostatin analogs is debulking of the tumors with liver-directed therapies, whether it's by interventional radiologists or surgeons. We can increase the dose of the somatostatin analog or shorten the interval. So most of the time they're given every four weeks. Maybe we need to give them more frequently than that. Years ago, they were using low-dose interferon, although this has really fallen off the algorithm. And we can rotate the somatostatin analogs. If people are still not responding to these and there's still refractory carcinoid syndrome symptoms, we need to think about other things that cause these symptoms, particularly like diarrhea. For example, people can get pancreatic insufficiency from the somatostatin analog itself. You might have short gut syndrome related to bile resections or issues with the absorption of bile salts or loss of bile salts. Maybe there's some other infection going on or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or some other condition that needs to be diagnosed. Pancreatic enzyme insufficiency can be an issue, particularly with somatostatin analog use. Checking a fecal elastase or checking the stool for a pancreatic enzyme called elastase can be helpful, although sometimes it's misleading because profuse diarrhea can make your fecal elastase low anyways. The consideration for pancreatic enzyme insufficiency should be considered only when there's fatty diarrhea. And if that's the case, some guidelines have suggested trials of pancreas enzymes to see if it helps with fat uh, absorption. Ileal resections are common in patients with uh, ileal neuroendocrine tumors and other bowel surgeries. If there's a small portion of the ileum that's resected, then usually the liver just increases bile production to account for the loss. But a lot of bile acids wind up getting all the way to the colon. They can cause issues with water absorption and increased secretions, and this can lead to diarrhea itself. We use bile acid binders like cholestyramine or Wellcol to try to soak up these bile acids before they get to the colon and cause problems. If there's really large portions of the distal small intestine or the ileum removed, then we can, might have issues with keeping up with bile acid loss. So sometimes this includes resections that uh, involve the ileocecal valve, but the bile pool is depleted during the day and this leads to fat malabsorption. It can be pretty difficult to treat. Sometimes we try adding bile acids or glutamine or growth factors, but it's not always easy to deal with. You know, people don't love collecting their stool, but thankfully we have some uh, better tests nowadays to look for this. We can collect a two-day stool collection and measure how many bile acids are there. It's important to note that if we're going to do this kind of 
uh, stool testing that we have to have enough fat in the stool during the day to get an accurate collection. So patients on a really low fat diet might get weird results. Again, we can use bile acid binding agents to help with this bile acid malabsorption issue. There's a lot of infections people get. It's important to think about these, especially if people have had antibiotics or been in the hospital, for example, and we should be considering things like Clostridium difficile. But checking for other infections is important too, especially if things uh, aren't responding to the usual course of treatment. Testing the stool can be really helpful for this kind of stuff. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, this is common in a lot of patients that have had previous surgeries or are exposed to different medications like antibiotics. This is where bacteria from the colon, uh, where bacteria normally live, have creeped up into the small intestine where they don't belong. And their presence in excessive numbers can cause all kinds of symptoms, particularly things like bloating and diarrhea. We can treat this with antibiotics, uh, and sometimes we tailor this to the type of uh, organisms we find. Breath testing can be really helpful, and here's an example of a breath test where patients are asked to breathe into these bags every uh, 20 minutes, and we collect and measure the hydrogen and methane content. We can also look for other malabsorption issues like sucrose or fructose malabsorption. Lactose intolerance, which involves lactose malabsorption, is probably the most common one and the thing people are most familiar with. Telotrostat is a, a very new drug that um, some people feel is really, really helpful in patients that have refractory carcinoid syndrome uh, symptoms. It's been studied in patients with carcinoid syndrome who have at least four bowel movements a day. There's a potential role in patients with stable radiographic disease and refractory carcinoid syndrome uh, symptoms, with sub, particularly with suboptimal control of diarrhea. Some guidelines have suggested that in this setting, it could be the drug of choice. As we talked about before, pancreatic neuronal tumors can produce other symptoms, so sometimes we use other drugs. Things like gastrinomas that are producing high amounts of gastrin lead to big increases in uh, stomach acid output. So we use things that block stomach acid like proton pump inhibitors, things you might be familiar with like omeprazole uh, or pantoprazole to block acid uh, coming out of the stomach. And again, you'll see a theme where we're using long-acting octreotide for many of these things. You're also seeing that refractory peanut symptoms, we might use uh, nonspecific antidiarrheal agents or liver-directed therapy like we talked about for other neuroendocrine tumors. What can we do if uh, second-line therapy for treating tumors and mats? Well, there's all kinds of tumor-directed therapy, surgical debulking, hepatic arterial, arterial embolization, and targeted things using um, uh, uh, dotatate uh, tag to uh, treatment. But uh, these are better talked about by the oncologists who use these things more commonly. But just know that directing uh, therapy to uh, patients, particularly who have liver predominant disease and suboptimal carcinoid syndrome control uh, can really help with reducing the symptoms. What about diet therapy? This is always something that I want to know more about. Patients who are newly diagnosed with neuronal tumors who don't have symptoms should follow a healthy diet based on current USDA recommendations. Patients who are symptomatic from carcinoid syndrome uh, may do well to follow a couple of uh, rules of thumb. Avoiding spicy foods or um, alcohol may help to prevent flushing or even diarrhea. Things like pepper, cayenne pepper, mustards, those are often offending agents. There's also common trigger foods when these uh, patients with neuroendocrine tumors have been surveyed. Things like tomato dishes, chocolate, nuts, raw veggies, these can also trigger diarrhea and other symptoms. For select patients, uh, avoiding high amine-containing foods can be really helpful. Uh, avoiding high fat foods can be helpful in avoiding caffeine as well as large meals. We'll get into the amine-containing foods a little more in a couple of slides. It's always important to stay hydrated and replace electrolytes when you're having issues with diarrhea. And as we talked about, because serotonin production can be um, shunting away the production of niacin, some patients may need niacin supplements. It's important to work with a dietitian. And if you have a history of surgical resections or are having carcinoid syndrome symptoms, especially if there's weight loss, then that's the time when we start to consider things like multivitamins, niacin, and dietary modifications. Somatostatin analogs can lead to pancreatic dysfunction and steatorrhea, as we already talked about. And so in those patients, we think about pancreatic enzyme supplementation, as well as potentially supplementing fat-soluble vitamins that may be low due to fat malabsorption. So a few words about amines and foods. These are usually present in aged, fermented, or spoiled protein products. And these can trigger carcinoid tumors to secrete other things that cause symptoms. Examples of amines are things like tyramine, 
dopamine, serotonin, and histamine. And reactions to these things include increases in blood pressure, headache, uh, skipping or racing heart, flushing, even passing out. So this box shows a couple of high amine-rich foods, things like aged cheeses, alcohol, smoked, salted, or pickled meats, as well as you see uh, some foods that are moderately high in amines like caffeine-containing drinks, coffee, soda, chocolates. There's more about this on a very popular website that talks about these nutritional concerns for carcinoid patients with a link noted below. I've included here some references if you want to see where I got some of this information. And thanks for your time and letting me uh, talk about this topic. Mm.